Hey everyone, welcome to Construction DEI Talks, a podcast where we will talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion as it relates to the construction industry. My name is Jorge Quesada, and I am the Vice President of Inclusive Diversity at Granite Construction. And joining me as co-hosts are Stephanie Roldan, Director of Lean Culture at Rosaden, and Abby Combs, Inclusive Diversity Partner at Granite Construction. On each episode, we're going to open up the floor for conversations with subject matter experts about how we can make the industry a more diverse and inclusive place for everyone and make our industry stronger. Amy, welcome. Thank you. I know that Stephanie and you have developed a relationship and we want to explore that. We want to explore your work, the great things that you do around leadership and around bias. So Stephanie, any other thoughts as, as we get started? When I met Amy, I actually joined her on a podcast that she was hosting, Living Corporate. And I was immediately drawn to what she was what she was doing in that space. And then obviously I explored her beyond that and formal introduction. So it's Amy Wanninger joining <laughs> us. She defines her work as helping reclusive nerds become inclusive leaders. Check and that out. Yeah. It, it, isn't that great, right? Yeah. Where and, and I'll be honest, I, I think I'm ultimately a bit reclusive myself. So she, she might need to help me a, a bit more. But I thought, Jorge, how interesting one to have someone with a different background who's written a book really about how to build our own network mm. to be inclusive and yep. how those connections can be our individual competitive advantage. And so I thought. That's something I think that construction individuals could really use, right? Like a tool to add to our toolkit. How do I do that? How do I build my own network? Am I making all the right connections I need? And then how do I really build that into my career? Yeah, now it makes sense. One of the things that we always ask our guests, and we're really happy that uh, Stephanie's brought you on to our podcast. Can you recall a time when you felt the most different? and the types of emotions that that brought out. Yeah. So I'll start with just being in IT. I got a computer science degree as my second degree because I needed a job. My first degree wasn't didn't get me where I wanted to go. Just in one of my computer science classes, I remember a professor looking at me and saying, you don't belong here. Mm. And he wasn't saying that because of how I looked or anything. He was saying that because there was like a recommended prerequisite it wasn't required. It was recommended and I hadn't taken it yet. And he kind of made this general assumption that everybody in the room had taken the course and I had not because it was coming in as a second degree. So I skipped some of the, the general ed classes. And he said, well, you don't even belong here in front of the whole class. And I remember just fighting back just really hot, angry tears. I was so insecure about the work I was doing anyway in IT and, you know, it was just like a complete departure from what I was used to having, you know, gotten a BA in social sciences before that. And so I just remember thinking like, maybe he's right. Maybe I don't belong here. And I left class and I finally kind of just let the tears fly. And then I thought, no, I'm going to prove to him that I'm, I'm as worthy of being here as anybody else. And, and I did fine, but I think that was the first time, you know, in my professional life where I really felt like I didn't belong. Thank you for sharing. That is so powerful. As we were looking at your CV and, and getting into the conversation, one of the things that hit me was the word network. And now that you shared, you have that IT, so that resonates now, it makes sense. Um, because when I hear the word network, I think of relationships. And so I replaced the word network and put the word relationships, right? Beyond bias. And, and I thought, wow, tell us, like, what was your thinking in when you were writing the book? What were you trying to bring across? Why is it important to go beyond bias? Because there's all kinds of exercises that people do around showing people that, that you are biased when it comes to your networks, right? So on LinkedIn, how many people does it take or how many people do you have to count before you identify a woman in your network or a person of color? Or if, if you're a woman, the first man, because sometimes you see the networks that you're, you're, you're biased to go to the same people that you hang out with. 
So walk us through that, Amy. Share with us about the book, what you do. Give us all the info. Sure thing. So Network Beyond Bias was not something I thought I was going to write ever in my life. I I always wanted to write a book. This wasn't the book I thought I was going to write. But what happened was I was working in, you know, I had a 20-year career in information technology. The last 12 of those were in the insurance industry. And while I was there, the company that I worked for hired a chief diversity officer. And I started reading about the goals and the job description of, of that individual. And I was like, oh my gosh, how do I go do this work? So basically I volunteered. If they didn't lock the door, I was in there trying to have some kind of influence or learn something. I wanted to be a part of this team so bad. And so I just kept volunteering for everything I could. And I went to a conference. It was an insurance industry conference. And of course, I was kind of an outsider within the insurance industry because I was an IT person within insurance. So you're, you know, you're never really one of the club until you've sold insurance, but <laughs> <laughs> but I want to do my part. So I went to this conference and, and a couple of things kind of happened all at once. One, I was super nervous about going because 3000 people in one place just kind of overwhelmed me as an introvert myself. Two, there were a whole lot of sessions talking about diversity and inclusion in the insurance industry. And now we know there are problems in every industry, right? But insurance has its own unique challenges. And so I went to all those sessions and I kept thinking, yeah, but what can I do about it? I'm not the CEO of a big company. I don't write public policy, right? I I don't control the rates of insurance. I don't control the actuarial tables or anything like that, right? I'm just, I'm one person in this huge organization, in this ecosystem that's just overwhelming. What can I do? And so I thought, well, you know what would be really cool is if next year I came back to this conference and did a session on what can the average person do? to make a difference. And they said, oh, that'd be great. And then I kind of mumbled some four letter words under my breath because I realized I had to then figure out what that was. So what I started thinking about was, well, what does it look like? You know, first of all, you want to get people in the room if you're speaking at a conference because you can have a great talk, Yeah, that but if there's nobody there to hear it, it doesn't matter. (laughs) So I thought, well, what do people care about? Well, everybody in that industry and in a lot of industries, but in that industry in particular, they really care about two things. They care about the longevity of the industry because there's a mission-driven piece to that industry that's really important. And they care about the stability of their careers. People don't go into insurance because it's sexy. They go into insurance because they know they're going to be employed until they retire. And so I thought, well, if I can hit on something related to diversity and inclusion that also hits on those two principles, longevity of the industry, sustainability of my career, then I'm going to get people in the room. So then I thought, well, what does everybody need for those two things to happen? We all need robust networks. If you're in a big company, You need a good, robust network within the company to get stuff done because nothing gets done through official channels in a company. It's all having a conversation with the person that you know and the other department that can get you the person that you need to get you the information because it's not documented anywhere, right? That's how companies work all the time. And if you want to bring people into your company or into your industry, you need to be sure you're connected with people outside. And so I started thinking about, well, what would it look like to have a really robust network? And I created one of those tools, Jorge, that you're talking about, where you figure out how diverse is your network. Number one, who do you need there? And then who's missing? And when I did that, I took my own assessment and I did not like what I saw Mm. at all. I don't know if you all watched Seinfeld when it was popular, but it was okay. So there was an episode of Seinfeld (laughs) where Elaine falls into this group where it's like the bizarro world of her current friend group. Yeah. Right. There's a guy that looks kind of like Jerry. There's a guy that looks kind of like, you know, uh, Kramer. There's a guy that looks kind of like George and they're getting, getting ready to make plans. And Elaine's like, yeah, I'd love to come. And George says, well, can I go? And Elaine looks at him and she looks at the other short kind of balding guy. And she goes, we already have a George. Mm. Right. And I started thinking about that in terms of our networks. A lot of us have a George and we probably have 10 of them. And we probably have 10 Jerry's and five Elaine's, right? But we don't mix it up. We just keep meeting the same people over and over in different contexts because that's who we're drawn to. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we go to the people that look the most like us. We go to the people that have the closest background to what we have. We go to people in the same industry. We go to people in the same department. Our world just becomes so small. 
So if we think about, well, what can we do to get outside of that? What can we do to get a little uncomfortable and break the mold in our networks? Think about how much more we could learn, how much more value we can add Mm. and how much more opportunity we can share. And once I figured this out, my whole life changed. Mm. And I thought, I can't make this a one-time thing at one conference in one industry. This is something people need to know about. And, and, and so as, as you're walking us through that, what comes to mind is, Amy, as you're talking, you're talking about the construction industry as, as well. To me, it's fascinating how you've taken a concept that was working with you in, in financial services per se. But as as I'm listening and, and, and processing what you're sharing, you know, when you talk about one person in an ecosystem, you know, sometimes you feel like that one person in your company and in the industry. And then what can someone in, and this is why we have this, our podcast, right? Is how do we get people thinking about what can they do from intent to impact and, and make an impact in this work? You know, one of the things that you've touched upon, because it's the bias, right? Let's not forget that that's in the title of your book, but it's in the title of many things that you have put together, right? Whether it's leading beyond bias, a program you have as well. Why do you focus so much on bias and can you deconstruct the word bias or, or share with our audience why you, you focused on that? Well, it was partially to kind of tap into this kind of the Howard Ross movement of diversity and inclusion education, you know, that's kind of been going on for the last couple of decades on unconscious bias, right? People really want to want to tap into this notion of unconscious bias. So I wanted to pick a word that would resonate with people in this space. But also a lot of the unconscious bias training that I've been to doesn't really ask anything of us, right? We learn, oh, this is part of the human condition. It's how our brains are wired. And we all feel like if I woke up today with my heart in the right place and I go to a class that tells me, well, I'm just like everybody else, there's really no incentive for me to change. And what I always tell my audience is your heart can't be in the right place if you never move your feet. What you think, what you feel, what you believe really doesn't change the world at all. It's what you do based on what you think and feel and believe that matters. And so until we start moving our feet, until we start getting uncomfortable, we're letting bias be the driver of our lives. And all bias is, for those of who are listening who are not familiar with what this is, bias is just a preference for or against. And our most base preference is toward things that are comfortable and known. I call it the the difference between been there, done that, and that might kill me, right? And we try as humans to live as much in the been there, done that realm as we possibly can because there's no adrenaline there. There's no heart attacks there. There's no sleepless nights there, right? We can just live in that space and never be uncomfortable. The problem is what unconscious bias is, is we make that decision without ever realizing we're doing it. And to me, unconscious bias is all the decisions we make that we don't know we're making. Well, one of the ways I show people that they're doing that, even though they don't think they're doing that, is we talk about who's in your network. And after we have their top five people in their network, I say, okay, out of those five, how many are outside of your industry? And in that moment, about 90% of the room gets it. Mm. Why would I go to a conference that's not in my industry? Why would I go to a networking event that's not inside my industry? Are all of your customers in your industry? Well, no. Are all of your vendors in your industry? Well, no. Okay, so why would you go to one of these other events? Oh, now when we take that and we start talking about interpersonal differences, not just career differences or industry differences, now you can see pattern over pattern over pattern of how that been there, done that mentality has been driving your life in ways you don't realize and limiting your opportunity. And it's tragic. It's interesting that you bring up the industry question because I would probably say that in the last five years, I've spread my wings a bit outside of the construction industry, right? So the moment I graduated high school at 18, I joined construction. And every relationship I developed thereafter was within that industry, right? Even when it comes to how we procure our materials, who we're selling our services to, which is generally general contractors or a client 
who needs something built. And I would develop relationships even with those, those clients, those semiconductor clients. But the, again, they had a branch that was their construction specialist. So they were very much just like me, right? Even though they were in that business, they were sort of just like me. And then I joined our training department and started doing things around how do I leverage neuroscience to find the best teaching methods? What are the best things in instructional design? So now, now all of a sudden I'm starting to tap into different people who are trained differently, think through things differently than myself, even to like meeting Jorge, right? You know, in that DE&I space, starting in insurance, different industry, also different specialty. So you bring up a fantastic point, Amy, which is I actually didn't know prior to this last five years what I was really missing. Like the people I needed to know, the people that would enhance my life, the people that would help me meet some of my goals and, and what I wanted to achieve, not only professionally, but personally. And you're right. It's, it's a huge miss. And to build on that, so now you're bringing out, Amy's brought out my reclusive nerd around neuroscience, right? Because I think when we talk about bias, and thank you very much for acknowledging Howard Ross and the work that he has done. And the reason why he's so important from a DEI perspective, he's kind of like in the Mount Rushmore of practitioners and, and subject matter experts when it comes to bias. So thank you very much for that acknowledgement. I love Howard personally and professionally. He's he's a wonderful human being. He really is. He's been a good mentor to me. He was one of the first people that I, I started following and reaching out to when I wanted to move into this space. And he's incredible. Yes. And in the show notes, we'll add his name and information because he's also written some great books around bias. But I really love this analogy you gave because we've talked about the intent can't just live in your head and in your heart. You have to take action. And I love the framing of, I could just see that, right? Your heart has to move. You have to move your feet. I, I love that. It, it, it will always stay in the same place if you, if you don't take that first step. So thank you for that. But the neuroscience is really, our brains are designed, right? They are built to protect us. They are built to just drop dopamine Every time, Stephanie, you meet someone in the industry because you could geek out. So every time you do that, the chemicals in your brain are rewarding you. It's almost like Instagram or Facebook with the likes. So just keep that in mind. And that's what happens when we, we do the things that Amy is talking about, like meaning that we have the same people, the same industry. But when you delve outside of it, that's that moment of truth where you either go to reward right? Or you go to threat. And it's that moment that you have to take that step, that action that Amy's talking about that says, I got to meet someone new. I got to get outside of this network. And, and as I share that with you, Amy, how much of from, from the neuroscience do you bring in into talking? Because I think what I also hear you saying is we have gone to workshops where we're told we're biased, but no one tells us how to mitigate the bias because our brains are not wired to know that when we're being biased. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I talk about this quite a bit and I have a couple of different programs I do. When I talk about networking beyond bias and I talk about unconscious bias, I, there's a three-step kind of action plan that I recommend to people. And the first is just notice notice how you feel throughout the day when you meet somebody new, when something changes, right? Are you Are you immediately guarded or are you immediately comfortable? And regardless of what the answer is, ask yourself why. Mm. A lot of times we assume when we meet somebody new, we don't like them. We think, oh, well, there's something about them. That's almost never the case. It's something about us mm. that's causing us to not like them. Mm -hmm. They look like somebody that we didn't like. Or I remember one time I, I met this guy and I thought he was a little, I thought he was odd. I'm just going to say it. I thought he was a little <laughs> odd. And I was like, I don't know if I like this guy. And my husband goes, well, he's from Canada. And I said, what's that got to do with anything? He said, well, it's like if you look at something like five degrees offset culturally, right? He's like five degrees offset culturally. And that's coming across to you as weird because you never interact with people from Canada. But that's why you're a little like there's something there that you can't figure out. That's what it is. He's five, to, you know, he's just a little bit off of what your expectations are. And I said, oh, okay. So then I got to know him and I was like, okay, well, so then I'd ask him like, is that a Canadian thing or is he just being weird? He's like, no, that, that was weird. But the other <laughs> thing was a Canadian thing, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> cause you gotta kind of, you gotta kind of figure people out. So the first thing is just notice and ask yourself like, why? 
you know, is it because the person's taller than you or shorter than you, or, you know, they have a lazy eye or, you know, maybe they have an accent and you're self-conscious because you don't understand what they're saying. There's all sorts of things happening in between our ears that we think are interpersonal problems that aren't. That's the first thing. And we're always protecting some part of ourselves with that, right? And it's usually an identity. And that identity is usually, I'm a good person. And there's some threat to our feeling that we're a good person that makes us hold somebody else at arm's length. And I can kind of tease that out in a much longer segment. But the second step is to then notice, like, how are other people responding? Because other people are different. And I'm sure it happens at your job that people have differences of opinion about things Mm -hmm. that can't just be everywhere I've worked. Right. Mm. So when you find somebody who, you know, if you want to go left, they always want to go right. Or, you know, if you want to go up and they always want to go down, like whatever the thing is, if you know, you're going to love a movie and they're going to hate it. That's the person you need to be having lunch with every week Mm -hmm. because they're seeing things that you don't, they're bringing experiences and values and judgments and identities to that moment. Mm-hmm. that you can't access without their help. And then the third piece is really just, I call it pressing your pause button. There's this little space under your nose. It's called your filtrum or your medial cleft. It's right there. It kind of looks like a pause button on a remote. Mm-hmm. If you physically put your finger there, it does two things. Number one, it, it makes it look like you're thinking. <laughs> and it makes it really hard to talk. Oh. And that's important because most of us, our first response to something, our first reaction is to say something, say what we're thinking, say what we're feeling, repeat what we've heard, right? Play out a script that we've played before. And putting our finger there for just a moment gives us just a couple of seconds to get more information into our frontal cortex, Mm -hmm. right? So we can make better decisions based on more information. So I go through a lot of that. And I also talk about when I talk about, especially responding to change and the shortcuts that our brains take. I talk about water makes a a path down a a hill or a mountainside that eventually becomes a river, right? Follows the same path. And the water carves out that path over and over and over. Well, the neural pathways in our brains do the same thing, right? Creates a shortcut from point A to point B. And that's the way the the thoughts will always flow. And if we wanted to change the course of a river, we'd have to put some effort into damming it up and diverting it somewhere else. Mm. And the same is true of our thought processes, these shortcuts our brains take. We need to put some thought into why is it going that direction? How do I stop it and push it somewhere else? Yeah, I I love that because I think what you're bringing to the table here, not only is the wisdom around the work, but also how we tend to interact. Recently, there's been conversation both external to the industry or just in general, when we talk about bias, that difference, talking about differences so much is not good that difference really divides us. And what you're challenging us to think about is, is that it's important for us to embrace the difference, to embrace getting out of our comfort zone, because that's how we learn. That's how we move forward. That's how we take steps forward in this space. So, so thank you for sharing that. Walk us through this good person thing. I'm fascinated by why you brought up good person, because I think all of us see ourselves as being good people. But I have this personal belief that being a good person is relative. What does it even mean to be a good person? I mean, Mm. you ask 100 people, what does it mean to be a good person? And what they're going to tell you is not what a good person is. They're going to tell you a, a prioritized list of values for them in that moment. And the second you ask a follow-up question, they're going to have to rethink their definition. And every follow-up question you ask is going to lead them further and further away from that first thing that they said. Mm. And so one of the things that I love to do as homework is just go write an essay on what you think makes somebody a good person and then have somebody challenge every single word of it. Because no matter what you think a good person is, you can find an example of somebody who embodies those values, who's a terrible person, right? In your own mind, or you can find somebody who's the exact opposite of that description, who in your mind is a good person. And I'll give you, I'll give you a very simple example. I live in the Midwest. And one of the things that people say here as a shortcut, I asked somebody in my neighborhood, I'm like, do you know a good plumber? We're new to the neighborhood. I need a plumber. And they recommend their 
brother-in-law, Jim, he's a plumber and he's a Christian. Now, Jim's religion and his ability to fix my faucet are completely decoupled in my mind, Mm. right? There, there is, there is no religion that makes somebody a better plumber than another plumber. Intellectually, I think we all know this, the shortcut that person's telling is using by saying, you know, oh, Jim's a good plumber and he's a Christian is Jim's a good plumber. And then in the not stuff said is, and he's a Christian, which means he's a good person and he'll treat you fairly and, 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 right. There's this whole set of, of characteristics that that person has ascribed to being a Christian that they are lumping into that label alongside good plumber. Now, Joe may be a a Christian and he may be a very good person or Jim. Jim might also be a Christian and not be a very nice person, right? I don't know, but this person says, right, that's that's their shortcut. That's what they mean by good person. So if if I were to say, well, what makes somebody a good person? And they say, well, they need to be a Christian. I'll say, well, does that mean that Muslims can't be good people? Oh, well, of course, Muslims can be good people. Okay, well, can Jews be good people? Well, of course. Can Buddhists be good people? Well, of course. Can atheists be good people? Well, of course. Can agnostics be good people? Well, of course. Can Christians be bad people? Well, yeah. Why is, in your mind, Christian an equivalent of a good person, right? And so it's it's just these little nuances of things where we kind of take shortcuts around what makes somebody a good person. And so anytime somebody says, oh, they're a really good person, well, what makes them good? Oh, well, they serve in the community. Okay. Who do they serve in the community? Well, they serve the school board. Okay. Well, whose interest do they serve in the school board? Right. You just keep asking questions. And then pretty soon it's like, well, it sounds like your cousin seems pretty selfish because really he's just representing his own interest in the school board. He wants what's best for his kids that play tuba. Right. Like, is that a good person? Like, I don't know. You tell me. So it's just interesting to me. It's an interesting conversation. It's one I have with my kids a lot right? What makes somebody a good person? And they'll, we'll talk about that for a while because we want to put people in buckets. We want to know, are they been there, done that? Are they safe? Mm. And this notion of good person is everybody wants to believe they're a good person. Well, the truth is we are all nice to some people and we are all not nice to some people, right? We all have moments of kindness and generosity, and we all have moments of selfishness and greed. We all have moments of malice, and bad intent. And we all have moments of kindness and good intent. So it's just, to me, it's just a really, it's, I guess it's a lazy way of thinking from my own history, where if I think somebody's a good person, I kind of ignore all the bad stuff they do and vice versa. And so I just like to challenge that notion a little bit. Yeah. It's it's kind of, uh, when we think about it individually, right? It's that attribution bias. I, I believe that I acted out of good intent, but anytime someone else faults, there was, there was something in there that was not on the up and up, right? I, I don't give them the benefit of doubt that I'm giving myself. Right. And if people are like us in some way, we, ex- we extend that same acting in good faith assumption to them as well. So in this conversation, I, I guess I want to kind of pivot a little bit and focus on the construction industry and say, Amy, you know, in the work that you're doing, you know, I don't know how much work you've done in the construction industry itself, but from your perspective, from your view, from your filters, talk to us about what we in the construction industry can do to either mitigate our biases, amplify our brands, the work that we do, so we can show up differently in the marketplace or in the workplace. Yeah. So I think the first thing is for the individual, let's, let's start with the individual in the construction industry, because you're in the industry, you know, that not everybody in the industry is the same. You don't all do the same kinds of work. You don't all think the same way. You don't all act the same way. You don't all bring the same strengths to the job, right? There's some people in construction who are very good at math and there are people in construction who are very good at design. And there are people in construction who are very good at customer experience, user experience, or wayfinding, right? There's all these different specialties within that space. So think about what is it that you bring to a team or to a department or to a company or to the industry that really fills you up and that brings value to others. Because once you know that, you're ready to go start meeting people because now you know how you can help them. And, you know, Jorge, you said at the beginning, when you think about networking, you think about relationships. A lot of people don't. A lot of people think networking is about transactions 
and trading up and asking for favors and kind of scorekeeping. Mm. And when you go at networking from this place of here are here's the basket of things I can do to help somebody else, it completely changes the approach that a lot of people would use to networking, right? Because now you're just like, I have, I have a basket of goodies I want to give away. I want to see who can use this stuff. And the goodies are all gifts that you have inside of you. So that's the first thing. The second thing is go get uncomfortable. Go to places where if you're an engineer, go to the design conference. If you're a designer, if you're an architect, an interior designer, go to the trades conference and find out what's going on there. I mean, just think about like materials change over time, right? Who knows about that first? People in the trades. Mm -hmm. That's got to get back to the design team. This is how we innovate, right? So you start cross-pollinating these ideas within different groups. You talk to people in insurance. You talk to people in city planning. You talk to people in state government. You find out what's going on. You find out where the trends are. Now you're creating opportunities for your company. You just have to think bigger about your career. Now, as far as what can the industry do or can organizations do within the industry, I'm going to use Stephanie as an example. Stephanie was 19 years old and got an apprenticeship in the trades. And I'm betting, and I think we talked about this, Stephanie, that you were probably the only woman on that crew and probably the youngest woman for a lot of crews, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. I was the, I was the only for quite a long time and definitely the youngest, even even in some circles now, still the youngest in the the positions that I've I've held. Yeah. So how did you get in? I got in because my uncle had familiarity with the trade. And familiarity with you and saw your potential. Yep. Right? So if you're inside, look for people on the outside you can bring in. Companies, organizations, individuals. And, you know, I want to be very clear about this, even though I come from IT and insurance and all of that, the trades are good jobs, really good jobs and a really good path for a lot of people. And ones they don't consider why, because for at least the last 30 years, up until maybe a couple of years ago, it was go to college, get a four-year degree, go to college, get a four-year degree, go to college, get a four-year degree. And the trades were not pushed in, in the public imagination nearly as much as they should have been. Now we're in a shortage. And what happens, right, when when we have a recession or when we need to rebuild or when we have a, a country with crumbling infrastructure or we have a labor shortage or we can't get goods from overseas, what do we need? We need people in the trades. That's who keeps our economy going. That's who keeps things up and running. It's almost, I hate to use the word like patriotic duty, but like we really need to think about from a whole social structure perspective, how do we tear down some of these barriers to entry for people who, like Stephanie, may not have been an obvious choice from somebody looking at it from the outside, but who's done amazing things and has has enjoyed a fantastic career in construction. Stephanie, thank you so much, right, for making this happen with Amy. Because, yes, I'm being a reclusive nerd and just listening, taking notes down, And I really appreciate the wisdom she's sharing. And one of the things that we like to do, Amy, as we start wrapping our podcast up, is we want you to think about three things. As we close and share from the basis, from the work that you do, what would you want the audience to think about being? So what we want them to be, what would you want the audience to know? And what would you want the audience to do when they think about building relationships slash networks beyond bias. Okay. So I'm going to say be less certain. And the reason I say that is because there are so many people with so many different perspectives than yours who are just as certain that they are right as you are. And you're probably equally right. Know that every person you meet knows something you don't know. And what that means in the reverse is every person you meet doesn't know something you do know. So every interaction you have can add value to both of you in the interaction. And the do is move your feet because having your heart in the right place doesn't mean a damn thing unless you get out there and put it into action. Amy, that was like a drop the mic, mind blown top three there. And Jorge 
Tay behind the scenes and myself want to really thank you for coming on our show. You know that I said when I left yours that I was going to stay in touch because the conversations you and I are entering, what we're trying to do for construction is a passion of mine. And I know the rest of the crew here at the Construction DEI Talks podcast. So with that, we want to thank you and just say from our bottom of our hearts, we really appreciate you joining us. Stephanie, thank you so much. Amy, how can people get a hold of you? Can you share your website, email address? I know we're going to put it in the show notes, but how can folks get a hold of you so that they can connect with you more? Of course. Thank you. So my company is Lead at Any Level, and you can find me at leadatanylevel.com, or you can find me on social media just about anywhere at Lead at Any Level. I know my last name's hard to spell, so it's sometimes easier to, to search for something that's easy to spell. And then you can email me directly, amy at lead at any level.com. Excellent. Thank you all so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Amy. And thank you for listening to our podcast. Be inclusive. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of Construction DEI Talks. And we hope you'll join us for our next episode. If you'd like to learn more about how you can make the construction industry a better place to work, please visit our website or reach out to us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram. There you will find more information on the latest developments in diversity, equity, and inclusion. You can find our webpage and email address and links to social media in the show notes. We'd love to hear from you. So be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. We'll catch you next time on Construction DEI Talks.